I guess we can start. Yeah, so welcome everyone to the final internship presentation talk of um, Damian Raymond is here. He's doing his PhD at um, CMU, Carnegie and Mellegan University in Pittsburgh with Professor Richard Stern. And he worked here a few months with us on um, real-time single, single channel speech enhancement with recurrent neural networks. And with that, the stage is yours. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, thanks for everyone for coming to my talk today. I'm going to present you uh, the work I'm doing for the past three months in collaboration with Sebastian. Uh, the title is Real-Time Single Channel Speech Enhancement with Recurrent Neural Networks. And let's get started. Um, so f throughout the talk, I'll be uh, first introducing single channel speech enhancement, formulating the problem. We'll go over um, not only the methods based on uh, deep learning, but also the cl classical signal processing methods. And then we'll move on to uh, our method based on a recurrent neural network and connect what we learned from uh, classical signal processing to uh, our decision in building our network. And we'll be doing a uh, thorough evaluation uh, on a bunch of objective speech quality measures and on a data set, a large scale data set um, um, with, uh, collected with the help of uh, Ross, Chandan, and Harry. And finally, we'll be um, concluding the talk and reporting some major findings. And let's get started. Let's get started with the introduction. Uh, so what is single channel speech enhancement? Um, simply put, single channel speech enhancement aims to reduce noise uh, and retain speech quality to the best extent possible from noisy speech. And our overall assumption is that our noisy speech comes from addition of a clean speech and the noise signal. And there is no other assumed uh, distortions like nonlinear distortion or channel distortion or reverberation. And the other general assumption we make is that noise attributes typically change slower than speech. And our goal is, as, we, as I said before, to suppress noise, to retain speech to the best extent possible to improve human or machine perception. And in this project, we, our goal is for the end users, the human listeners, uh, who are going to listen to the enhanced clips. So that's, that will be our focus. And let's have a overview of a, um, the, the generic speech enhancement pipeline. On top, we have the flow diagram of a, a classical signal processing based speech enhancement system. We start with our time domain waveform signal x of t and throughout the talk I'll be assigning x to all the noisy signals and that signal goes through a short time uh, spectral analysis in typical uh, typically the short time Fourier transform uh, to get the short time um, uh, character, character, uh, spectral characteristics and after that, we separate our, um, the short time spectral features into phase and into magnitude, denoted by these uh, little blocks there. Um, one challenging aspect of um, single channel enhancement is that the phase is typically very hard to recover. Uh, so that is uh, out of scope of our talk today as well. And we'll be leaving it as it is. Um, the noisy phase uh, for reconstruction. And we do our, the majority of our work from the, in the magnitude domain. And you see there are some generic modules to esti estimate noise or estimate the gain uh, from, the, from the magnitude of the, of the noisy spectra. And after that, we uh, send it into an estima estimator, what we call a gain estimator, that applies a um, basically a, a gain function in the frequency domain on each frame of our noisy spectra. And we use that to pointwise multiply to our noisy 
speech and use that enhanced magnitude to recover the clean speech. And that is the generic pipeline for over 30 years until deep learning uh, arise in the scene. And the basic pipeline is similar in the sense that we start with our time domain signal. We do some feature extraction, which doesn't have to be uh, spectral features anymore. It can be anything. Uh, but our end goal is still to estimate this uh, time frequency gain function denoted G with a hat there. Uh, and then multiply, point wise multiply that to the uh, noisy magnitude to recover um, the clean speech, hopefully. And as you can see here, everything else in the middle becomes more or less a black box because of the neural networks, thanks to that. And, um, and of course, with deep learning, we have a, a training data um, to leverage. Um, that's a huge advantage of the modern machine learning approach compared to the classical approach. Now, I would like to focus in this talk on several aspects we can improve in this deep learning block. The first is uh, feature extraction and the neural network itself, the learning objective, and how we actually train our system. Uh, our method will be uh, broken into four pieces. And before I get into the actual method, uh, let me briefly go over some uh, literature I picked, uh, some, uh, um, uh, as you can see, we have uh, six methods right here. The first two are from a classical signal processing based method. Uh, the middle two are deep learning based, uh, but uh, could not operate in real time. And the last two call uh, the rows are uh, deep learning based and can actually operate in real time. Um, as you can see here, I'm highlighting some the key methods that determine whether or not the method can be uh, real time process or not. And as you can see, like things like spectral subtraction, the the key part is estimating noise from a by a moving average filter, and for decision directed method, you have a recursive smoothing of the instantaneous measure of SNRs. Now, these measures can actually be done with with uh, with uh, if we drop the assumption of uh, online processing, and things like noise estimation actually can be improved massively if we incorporate uh, information from the future. Uh, but that's how the scene was set up. We want to keep that because uh, real-time processing is, I think, our ultimate goal. We have a speech coming in and we enhance it without looking into what's in the near future. And it's not that something they cannot do, it's just they keep the assumption that it's uh, real-time online processing. And although these two uh, deep learning methods here have done very well, they use information from the future, uh, which is breaking that assumption. And for that reason, we are focusing our model on a online single frame in, single frame out basis. And for that reason, uh, the last two methods are the uh, qualified candidates we, we want to compare to. And the last one is uh, not really real time because they train on a one second waveform. But yeah, all right. Let's uh, jump into the, the method part. So as I said from the flow diagram, we break our uh, method into um, four parts, the feature representation, the, the learning machine, the learning objectives, and how we train the network. And let's start looking at the first thing, the feature. And we use the most standard feature for our neural network, that is the short time Fourier transform magnitude. Uh, we also consider the short time log power spectra uh, with the negative 80 dB floor. Uh, what you see on the left is actually uh, the, the log power spectra with a linear mapping of a color and displayed it with a, uh, with a what do you call it, the jet color map in, uh, in MATLAB. Um, let's see. Yes. and. 
the f we have uh, three, uh, just for the ease of uh, looking, we have in x axis your uh, time in seconds, your y axis in uh, frequency in kilohertz, but we have three spectrograms stacked together. Uh, the top one, we have the, the noisy. I think that's uh, with uh, air conditioner noise at 20 dB. And in the middle, we have the clean speech signal. And on the bottom, we have this uh, weird looking uh, IRM, or you call it ideal ratio mass, which is uh, the ideal gain function. You plot it in 2D uh, on the dB scale, because if I would it, if I plot it in uh, between 0 and 1, you wouldn't have to see the, the contrast. Uh, yeah, and as I said before, the output we are trying to estimate is the, the real <laughs> magnitude uh, gain function, uh, the range between 0 and 1, and some technical details about how we uh, construct this uh, spectrogram. We have a 16K hertz sampling rate for our audio. We use a 32 millisecond analysis frame with a Hamming window and a 75% uh, overlap between. Hamming window or hand window? Hamming window. The 4% four, the four lifted window from the zero? Yeah. Not, not the hand window, the, the 0 0.46 plus 0 0.54 times the cosine. That's Hamming. Yeah. Hand window is from 0 to 1 to 0. OK, it's not hand, it's Hamming. Okay. Yeah, it's a raised cosine. Yeah. Did, did you try different windows? Uh, uh, different I, I briefly tried a 20 millisecond, 50% overlap, and it the, the performance went down for the, for the network that was like a month ago, and I set it aside and n never really changed my original setup. Yeah, but I think it'll work with, uh, well, the overlap might be a problem, but 20 millisecond window, I think it'll, it'll work. So why do you use the uh, log power spectrum? Uh, so the question I got is uh, why I use the log power spectrum is um, our our perception is uh, correlated on the log scale for audio. And as you can see, we are actually, visually, we can see the contrast uh, if we map linearly the, the value obtained from the log scale. If I did it for the just the magnitude, the contrast will be so low that you wouldn't uh, even know it, uh, visually see the difference. But the magnitude actually itself uh, already the information for the, for the power, right? If you just uh, uh, double the magnitude, I mean, just the well, times the max, 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 max it, it's, it's power, right? Well, the, 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 log, the log power is just a uh, nonlinear compression on the, li on the linear power. OK. okay. Uh, I, we'll actually do a um, comparison by, by feature later. So uh, oh, see. yeah, you'll, you'll see the result. Yeah. The dynamic range of, of audio signals is extremely high, and that's why we usually use a logarithm or something for plotting. And also, yeah. we assume that neural networks will uh, deal better with uh, slightly compressed data. They yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. That's what <laughs> most people find. And in addition to the, the feature I mentioned earlier, uh, we are exploring some different normalization techniques on audio features. The very first is uh, your standard global mean and variance normalization by frequency. Uh, and the statistics is uh, accumulated over 80 hours of random sa sampled speech from our training set. And in addition to that, we also explore uh, online mean and variance normalization. Uh, as Sebastian mentioned, the dynamic range of speech is very high, and it changes drastically over, uh, over time. And one way to, to deal with it is to smooth uh, the spectra in time. And we apply a three-second exponential window, uh, either globally or on a frequency, per frequency basis. And as you can see from the left here, in the, the top graph shows the uh, original noisy spectra. The middle one is a, uh, the spectra after frequency dependent normalization. 
and the bottom figure here is uh, after frequency, frequency independent normalization. Uh, the um, absolute value uh, or the color is not important. The, the contrast is more important. Okay. All right. So after the features, we are getting into probably the most important part of our system, which is the, the learning machine, the neural network itself. And uh, the recurrent neural network is the, the most natural choice for us because um, what the new recurrent neural network does is it outputs some value for, it has a notion of time first and foremost, and then it outputs something for this time instant based on some input you obtained uh, for the current time and also from the output uh, you get from the previous time stamps, which is similar to what we do with the filtering and all the classical approach we have with uh, speech enhancement. And so that's the basic stru structure we are based on. And one uh, example, well-known example recently, uh, that uses uh, RNNs for speech enhancement is uh, called RN noise. You can check out the paper in, with the reference uh, in the last slide there. Um, the, the network has a, I would say, a pretty complicated architecture. I'm not going to um, get into that. But the, there, there, there are two things that caught our attention. The first is the use of a uh, gated recurrent units, um, which has proven to learn long-term temporal patterns. Uh, effectively. And the second is a dense layer which really acts like a nonlinear transformation block to bring your feature from um, uh, learned from a, from a long-term uh, sequence into a, the, the gain function at that time instant. So we take their ideas and what we realized is that uh, it's important to have what we realized is it's important to have this uh, residual connections in the network somewhere. Uh, the residual connections facilitate deep networks to learn. And uh, there's a very famous paper a couple of years ago where um, the person was in the field of computer vision and he's doing some image classi classification task. And what he found is that uh, by having this simple residual, which means you're, imagine you have multiple layers and you're adding, simply adding the input from the very first layer to the later layers of the network, and that facilitates learning a extremely deep network, I think tens of layers, something like 20 layers. And that's in computer vision. And in our case here, uh, the, the depth of a network actually corresponds to the number of time frames. I'm, I'm going to explain that later. And because we are going to train the network with a very long sequence, uh, we believe that uh, the residue would help uh, within the network, and that, that's what we decided to do. And this is, uh, on the right, you see a standard gated recurrent cell. And what we did was we simply uh, add this uh, bypassing connection from the input to the where they add, aggregate all the uh, learn components and propagate that into the next layer. And after we do that, we did some literature research and found that there's actually a same idea has been applied in different, uh, in task already. There's a sequence classification and probably the most similar one is the this Chen 2017 <coughs> paper on feature compensation. They What they did is they estimate this mask for a 
male spectrogram for uh, speech recognition, but they don't. It's for enhancing the speech features as well, but it's not used to uh, reconstruct speech. So we have believed that this uh, block will do well, uh, but we don't stop there. Uh, we still need an entire network uh, that's going from our input feature to the, the output gain function. And what we did is simply stacking a few, in our case, uh, just three uh, grew, grew layers with our residue connections. If you uh, zoom in on each block, it'll look like this, except for the last layer if, where we don't add this residual. The justification is that for input features, we're getting something from audio which has a very high dynamic range. And all the output that coming out of the grooves is, com very, is compressed already. And we don't want to, in the last layer, bef before it gets transformed by a uh, fully connected layer, we don't want the, the input to, uh, you know, in dynamic range, mess up with uh, what's getting learned inside. So we don't have that. Everything else. Uh, has the, the residual. And in the end, we have a fully connected layer with a sigmoid function uh, that outputs uh, the gain between 0 and 1. And yeah, that is our network architecture. Now, let's move on to uh, the actual learning objective, which is probably equally as important as the, the network. We adopt the well-known mean squared error, uh, which is simply um, uh, okay. So I have an inconsistency in the notation here. So x here is uh, clean speech in uh, short time Fourier transform magnitude, and y is our noisy speech. And we are applying a gain function to the noisy speech, and just simply take the point-wise uh, squared error and average them across all time and frequency. So this is the mean squared error of the difference between clean and estimated signal? Yes. Uh, I would like to bring some uh, context about uh, minimum mean squared error. There's, uh, a seminal work by Ephraim and Malak in 1984. Uh, they they formulate the the uh, the problem by assuming complex STFTs of uh, speech and noise have Gaussian distributions and are uncorrelated, and they solve for the optimal solution in a minimum mean squared error sense. And for deep learning based approach, we actually don't have any assumptions about distributions of anything, and uh, we simply learn by stochastic gradient descent, and hopefully we get to a point where it's low enough for training and low enough for for test. And the mean squared error is, uh, has a stable convergence if you, uh, because if you take the gradient of a square, you have a linear gradient across everywhere. Raymond, yeah. the short-term frequent uh, Fourier transformation is Ephraim and Malak in 1984, but actually in time domain, it's Norbert Wiener in 1947. That's right, that's right. So Wiener filtering. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah, I was, I was going to emphasize the the, 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 the Gaussian. Yes. yes. Yeah. And that's Ephraim Malak. Yeah. But Wiener actually is based on mean squared error in time domain signal. Yeah, it's true. And with that observation, we, uh, we, re we can rewrite this uh, mean squared error. If we put it in statistical form, it's uh, in expected value instead of uh, actual average. And uh, if we just rewrite a little bit and we ignore the cross term there, uh, we ended up with two. Uh, that's a, by the way, that's a, that's a very, uh, very, cool. very coarse assumption that maybe doesn't hold, but for the, our goal is to separate speech distortion from noise suppression. And by ignoring the two terms, what we ended up is uh, actually the mean squared error between the, the signal enhanced. Well, the, the S here is the clean signal. So it's the mean squared error between the clean signal 
and the clean its signal itself uh, multiplied by the gain function. And we have a mean squared error of uh, just noise uh, multiplied by the gain. So because we are not solving for any optimal solutions in statistical sense, we uh, and also we want to balance the speech distortion and noise suppression terms. Uh, we we first did this approximation, and then we uh, come up with this uh, new loss function uh, that are that have two separate terms. The first one is on the speech distortion, and the second term is on, on noise suppression. So the, the the way to interpret this is, uh, let's say your uh, let's say your uh, enhancement system does nothing, which means the gain just simply pass everything, then your speech distortion is zero, but then you have all the error coming from the noise. And then by having a enhancement system that suppresses everything, you have a zero for the gain function, and, and then you get no error for the noise suppression, and you get all the error from the, from the speech. This will so technically, the first term was to keep the gain as, uh, as close to one as possible. And the second term was to make the gain as hard as possible to, as low as possible to yeah. suppress more noise. Yes. And you want to balance yeah. this with alpha. Yeah. Okay. And we, for the speech, we only do that for the speech active region. So we apply a, a simple uh, energy-based voice activity detector on the, on the speech here. And the detector is uh, simply thresholding on the energy accumulated from 3 kilohertz to uh, 5,000 hertz, which is uh, typically where speech happens. Yes. Yeah, that's a very crude uh, energy-based VAD. If you do it on noisy speech, it'll probably fail. Very, very, uh, yeah. And we don't stop there. We, um, we also have this observation from classical signal pr processing point of view that uh, when we have a noisy signal that's almost clean, then we don't want to destroy any uh, spe uh, speech content in there. So the, uh, the, uh, the result is we pass all the, almost all the speech, the noisy speech unchanged to hope that, uh, not to hope that, to retain the speech quality. And when there is so much noise in, in speech that we cannot even get a hang of where the speech is, we, we just apply a very heavy suppression on the entire thing. Uh, so that basically says, um, Ours, um, when the SNR is approaching infinity, we want very little speech distortion. And when the SNR is pro approaching zero, we want very aggressive suppression on the noisy speech. And motivated by this observation, we have this uh, new, another uh, loss function built on top of the, the previous one. Uh, with this SNR terms uh, multiplied to each part of the uh, loss function there. Uh, I have to mention here that the original intention was to uh, view this as a whole term. So this is the waiting for speech. And one minus the other multiplied with, like, with this parenthesis here. <laughs> That's the original uh, intention. but. Uh, it turns out I implemented that, <laughs> and uh, but not to confuse uh, uh, the audience. And for the result here, I'm showing the result coming out of this. But uh, one easy future work is to try with the, the corrected weighting, but we keep it as it is here. But this is just scales both terms with the same number. But but this is by by example. So you have imagine you have a batch of audio. Okay. Then yeah. your global cost function will be yeah. weighted. Same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But but still, it'll it'll be more correct if we do it uh, with uh, waiting on the 
on the alpha by the SNR. Sorry, why, why is the, that's the sigma not squared in the, the lower right side? That, that was the typo, sorry. That should be the square. Thank you. Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, and, and finally, for our method, we are um, we wanted to uh, study the effect of the uh, okay. Right. Uh, yeah. So um, right. Let me. Uh, sorry. Let me. <laughs> let me re redo that part. So from the classical decision-directed approach from Ephraim and Mala, we have a hidden state, the a priori and a posteriori SNRs, as your hidden states in deep learning language. And the hidden states from the previous estimate affect the current by a exponential smoothing process. And we have this analogy in the RNN-based approach, but what we have is a black box almost with hidden states that we don't know their, the, the meaning of the hidden states they carry. Um, but we know that they are capable of learning very long uh, temporal sequence. And they are learning through uh, back, back propagation through time. And we, we want to actually study um, the effect of the, the length of the sequence we pass in because um, this is just a simple pseudo recurrent neural network uh, I have here. So that your, this is your hidden state from previous time frame and the hidden state from the current as the output here. Then your input is x of t and you output some y of t here. And let's just say your hidden state of t simply equals to your output. And your output is simply a function of your input plus your previous hidden state. Then if we take the partial derivative of the output with respect to um, the learning parameters of the network, we see it's a function of your current instantaneous gradients multiplied by something from the previous time frames. And this t here, I, here I have from t all the way back to 0. But we can control this length and see how it affects um, the the, the impact, uh, uh, how it affects the uh, speech quality of the enhanced signal. So we are doing this comparison as well. OK. <coughs> That's the end of our method. And now let's move on to uh, evaluation. We have 84 hours of training data. Uh, the clean speech comes from the Edinburgh, Edinburgh 56 speakers corpus. The noise comes from uh, 14 noise types from demand database and free sound. Uh, for test, we have 18 hours of test cl uh, clips. Uh, uh, the, the noisy speech, uh, sorry, the clean speech comes from the Graz University 20 speakers uh, corpus, so there's no overlap to uh, training at all. And for noise, we are picking nine challenging classes from the, from the 14 in training, uh, but we have uh, different signals for test. And those are very challenging noise types. Uh, for example, the, we have the competing talker in neighbor, and we have uh, transient uh, noise, such as uh, munching or the door shutting and uh, airport announcement. And all noise clips? in the test data are not ever, ever presented in the training set? No, right, no. Right. Yeah. And we have five different combinations of SNRs from 0 dB to 40 dB with a 10 dB step. And all clips are sampled at 16 kilohertz. And this is just a, just a close-up look of the, the data we have. Uh, on top, we have clean speech. On the bottom, we have uh, the noise. This is a waveform plot in dB. And you see this is the same noise repeated five times here, uh, from 0 dB to 40 dB there. 
and we have the speech normalized to the same level, but it's the same speech repeated five times, right? Okay. And during training, what we did is, uh, is augment the data a little bit by randomly drawing a segment of waveform from clean speech, any clean speech file. And from noise file, we do the same, and we mix them. So the SNR wouldn't change. It's still the five discrete SNRs, but now you have different speech mixed with different noise. Yeah. Do we have this thing within one file? The drastic change of the noise. Can we have a segment like this? That, yeah, that's possible. Yes. Yeah. And it's probably a good thing for the network to, mm -hmm. to learn. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but it will makes your data set more difficult. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it might be even better to uh, mix with uh, different SNRs on the fly. So just draw one noise and draw one speech and mix at a randomly draw SNR level. But we didn't try that. So that, that's our data. And we have quite a few systems to compare. Uh, we start with uh, noisy, unprocessed, and we have the uh, statistical based, uh, this is a signal processing based method developed here at MSR without training data, of course. Uh, we have our proposed method here with uh, these uh, setup. And we have a recurrent neural network, which is simply our network, but removing the residual connection. So we want to study how effective that res residual uh, connection actually is. Everything else stays the same. For uh, RN noise, we use the original code published by Valley in 2018 um, because it's their, they have a package to do all the, all the training and, and testing, and we couldn't augment the data. So we just keep the data as it is. Uh, by our experience, the, aug the data augmentation up the PESC by that about 0.1 PESC score, and um, they don't have this. And keep in mind that this number will be lower than uh, what it potentially could be. And for simplified RN noise here, what we did is we simply took their network architecture, theirs is enhancing a very crude energy envelope. It's a 22 band, uh, but we have a full band, 257. Uh, so what we did was took their architecture, uh, scale up the feature dimensions to, to match it for, uh, for full band, and scale up all the other dimensions within the network to, to accommodate this uh, scaling difference. And we don't use a, the, they have, they are training with a voice activity detector as well, and we didn't use that there because we don't have label. Do as input or as output? So what they did is they have, they have the as output and they train it with, uh, with actual, with label, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we found that that's really helpful. So do we have this in the previous architectures? Uh, the VAD, no. For, for the proposed method is kind of built into the learning objective because of the speech distortion, mm -hmm. yeah. It is okay. in the RN noise, the original RN noise, but we found it didn't help. We randomized it and it didn't change anything. And. Um, sorry, Donna. Uh, yeah, yeah, surely I'm like, uh, I can't hear you. If you text me, uh, uh, let me know the question. And, 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 and finally, we have uh, Oracle information plus Wiener filter rule, which marks the theoretically the best what we can do. So we have seven systems to compare. And in terms of evaluation metrics, we have uh, four classical speech quality or intelligibility measures. Uh, they are the scale invariant signal di to distortion ratio. Uh, which is a really a robust version of SNR. And we have the capture distance, which measures uh, the, it's a distance metric in the capture domain. Uh, capture domain is supposedly you have a flattened um, channel and speech um, dimension. 
And for the third uh, short-time objective, intelligibility, this is in terms of percentage. And finally, the uh, perceptual evaluation of speech quality, uh, or PESC, which predicts a mean opinion score of a speech quality. And except capture distance, everything else is better with higher value. Capture distance is better with lower value. And we also incorporate this uh, new DNM-based mean opinion score prediction called uh, AudioMoss. It's trained on the MOS scored by real users, and it has a 0.89 Pearson correlation coefficient on test data. All right, ready for the result? Hey, Frank, one more thing. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, again, some experiments running on the machine. Uh, I had a question on the R noise in the previous slide. Um, yes. So if you use the original one, those tricot bands were defined assuming a 48 kilohertz sampling rate. Do you change that, or is it still using that? Uh, everything, I think, it's a 16 kilohertz sampling rate. Yeah, yeah, but did you change the code? Because that's uh, assuming a frequency is something that a 48, and the trito critical bands are spaced assuming 48 kilohertz. So you have very little resolution in the uh, 0 to 8 kilohertz range. Okay. Uh, because if that didn't happen, then it's probably not a valid comparison. I well, can. Yeah, so this is the original hard noise. It's not the one that, yeah. that shortly got modified. Yeah. Uh, then, then it's not a, I think we cannot compare it with 16 kilohertz input because the frequency bands are not meant for that. Okay. Well, we have, a, there's a better version it's of the it. The frequency bands are spaced in the 0 to 24 kilohertz. Yeah. So the one that we, we published yeah. in inner speech, or uh -huh. we will publish this year, that one was a modified hard noise. And it performed okay. way better than the original one. Yeah, I, I actually didn't check the, I don't remember the sampling rate because I did this baseline uh, almost three months ago. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but yeah. It, the, the, yeah, basically if you, if you use the R noise from GitHub and use it with 16 kilohertz speech, I would, I would not include it in the evaluation because that's the error. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, we have, I guess, subjective results, right? Well, the, uh, but, but the simplified R noise with the full band enhancement should still be in the talk uh, because we changed the architecture, right? Yeah. Because you're not using any critical Yes. All right. So in terms of result, let's... Uh, Let's first look at the, the, the best from each category. Uh, the, the best is with surrounded by quotation marks because I, I picked the best based on the best PESC score. I'll show later that uh, none of those objective measures actually uh, are optimal. But let's start with this comparison first. And um, as you can see here, um, the, the, the first thing to notice is that our noise has a tremendously less number of parameters because of the less dimension uh, from the crude energy uh, contour. And our system has uh, 1 million, uh, 1.26 million trainable parameters, but put that number into perspective, uh, can, it can actually enhance uh, one second of audio in uh, 30, 39.6 milliseconds on a single GPU with the GCR machine I use on just using Python and um, uh, with the CPU that's uh, 2.6 uh, gigahertz. So it's well uh, within the, the real-time processing constraint. Um, in terms of objective measures, we we can find that our method outperforms other systems in all categories. Uh, I'll, I'll explain this in the next few slides here. But you, again, I chose this, this one just because of the, the absolute best PET score obtained from the test data. But 
this is for the human listeners, right? So we want to listen to how it actually sound like. So we let's start with the noisy She sound. had jumped away from his shy touch like a cat confronted by a sidewinder. He had left her in violet, thinking familiarity would gentle her in time. Hey, Sato, can you hear that? Or is it true? You should, if it goes to the speakers. Wow. I can hear it. Yeah, I can hear it too. Okay. Thank you. So that, that was a bubble noise at 20 dB, and this no is uh, based on... She had jumped away from his shy awesome. touch like a cat confronted by a sidewinder. He had left her in violet, thinking familiarity would gentle her in time. That's based on classical signal processing. I'm, I'm going to skip a few here and uh, let's listen to the, the full band R noise. In a way, he couldn't blame her. She had jumped away from his shy touch like a cat confronted by a sidewinder. He had left her in violet, thinking familiarity would gentle her in time. And our proposed method? In a way, he couldn't blame her. She had jumped away from his shy touch like a cat confronted by a sidewinder. He had left her in violet, thinking familiarity would gentle her in time. OK. Uh, we did some comparison on uh, feature normalization, and we found that uh, normalization in general helps, uh, but maybe not as much as we expected. We expected to be. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip through this part. And on the effect of sequence lengths, we found that uh, five. Go, 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 go. Yeah. So the, fir the, the first four bars are based on a short time spectral amplitude. The next four bars are based on log spectra. And here we have the original spectra after global normalization, after online frequency dependent normalization, and after online frequency, frequency independent normalization. And the same for log spectra. Using exact same network architecture, only difference is the feature. Global normalization. So, for logs, the green log spectrum, global normalization is actually the best. Yes, yeah. for this is based on mean squared error only, not our, not the speech distortion weighted loss. Raymond, you mentioned that the twin speech is roughly the same. Yeah. Might be the but in reality, in reality, the thing for okay, this is valid if you have a closed off microphone, or you are roughly the same distance from the microphone. But if you are using an open microphone and you can be half a meter or five meters away, you already have a 20 dB difference in the level in the voice level, mm -hmm. okay. and that dynamic range is where the normalization would tremendously help. Yeah. Not here, so this is not, yeah. much, um, not much valid. Co any conclusion here is that's true. Okay, okay. that's true. No, but the speech is always at the same level. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, that's true. This you need you need to augment the data with the, uh, the whole mm. uh, input with different levels. You can <coughs> so you have a knob for your microphone, right? You can put it down 20 dB or yeah. crank it up. You don't know at which level you get the audio, so you need to. This is the dynamic range with normalization bubbles. So that's true. Not, not that's true. Here. That's true. Yes. Good point. And we also uh, study the the effect of sequence lens when we train the system. And uh, for the uh, so basically for every batch we are feeding one minute of speech, but it could be. 61 second segments, or it could be thir uh, two 30 second segments. And what we found is that I had to stop this uh, after 53 epochs because it was taking almost a week and uh, uh, is very slow. Uh, but what we so it's the last row here is not a fair compa comparison, but what we found is that five seconds is actually a, uh, a good number. 
uh, definitely better than uh, one second per segment. So this length actually, uh, and we're surprised by uh, the, the recurring units actually are able to learn from such a long sequence there. We have a eight millisecond overlap. So that means over 600 frames and it's still able to learn and learn well. So sequence length is what? The training the, examples? Yeah, the number of frames in the training example. <coughs> so a randomly sample a waveform, transform and let it learn. Mm -hmm. Uh, now the, the the more interesting results are from the the, the two loss function we had. Remember we have this uh, speech and distortion weighted loss by this term alpha there, and we're doing a sweep of alpha between zero and one to see where the optimal value is by different objective measures. And what we found is that um, first of all we see this uh, every measure has a nice shape. A starts something bad, goes to somewhere optimal, and goes bad again. Happens to every measure. Uh, second, they don't agree with each other. Uh, for <laughs> for, <laughs> for uh, speech and noise weighting, uh, we found that uh, audio models think uh, this, which is actually very high speech uh, distortion here. Let me play an example. Those answers will be straightforward if you think them through carefully first. Drop five forms in the box. Or you know if people yeah. were more generous, the, there you can no almost hear work. no noise, but the speech uh, uh, distortion is quite large. This mm -hmm. maximizes best. No, no, this maximizes uh, audio mass. The the DNN based uh, prediction. <laughs> And but let, let's listen to what what the pet what pest thinks the best is. Those answers will be straightforward if you think them through carefully first. Drop five forms in the box before you go out. If people were more generous, there would be no need for what they. It, it's right here. So the speech quality is uh, better, but you hear this residue noise that happens when the speech uh, occurs at the same time. And the I'm not going to play the other two because they are worse. And um, capture distance and story agree with each other. Great. Can you play? Yeah. Uh, that's uh, 6.65. Uh, six, OK, sure. Those answers will be straightforward if you think them through carefully first. Drop five forms in the box before you go out. If people were more generous, there would be no need for welfare. So it's much more noise than uh, the that's previous. Such improvement is recorded. Can you play the noise? Well, it is. So the speech is. Very, as Those answers will be straightforward if you think them through carefully first. Drop five forms in the box before you go out. If people were more generous, there would be no need for one. And if you want to compare PESC and audio models, because they are both predicting model scores, and you see this, they're agreeing more when there's, uh, so in this end, there's almost no suppression. So they agree more. Then when you get here, when there's a heavy speech distortion, then they, they start to disagree a lot. Probably other ones trying on artifacts like that. Yeah. So that's something to, to work on. And we also have this uh, uh, SNR weighted weighting here. And um, again, similar trend. And they don't agree with each other. And again, audio moss prefers very heavy suppression. We welcome many new students each year. George is paranoid about a few shortage. The content between us should be our No, no, no that was work. the speaker. No. Please shorten the scope for choice. Yeah. And Pesk and SDR here. We welcome many new students each year. George is paranoid about a future gas shortage. The content between us should be our oriental work. Please shorten the skirt for choice. And if you just go... We welcome many new students each year. George is paranoid about a future gas shortage. The carpet cleaners should include our oriental rug. Please shorten the skirt for choice. So this is on one example. Hard to say if it works equally well on the others, but my preference is around that 0.2, 0.3 range. All right. Oh, okay, let's get it, get into the end. And um, 
we have uh, some major findings uh, from all the experiments here. The first and foremost is uh, residual con connections really, really help. Uh, if you just compare the RNN with uh, uh, our proposed method, the only difference is the residue connection and it uh, makes a vast difference. And we are surprised to find that the, the recurrent units, in this case grooves, but probably LSTMs as well, are, are able to encode extremely long patterns at high dimensional space, yes? I have got one comment on that. You, you compared one and five, you didn't compare one and two. Second uh, segment. So it's possible that it learns more than one, uh, but it doesn't actually learn all the way up to five. Might be. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but still, for one second, it's already uh, 125 frames. So it's able to really learn from a very long term uh, uh, temporal patterns. And there is a point when I, I was looking at the enhanced uh, the, the gain function in dB and saw this constant suppression at 6 kHz. I was wondering what's going on until I saw this uh, example in training. We have a vacuum noise and there's a, just a tone uh, around 6 kHz and where speech don't usually occur there. So the network turns out it just learns to suppress that frequency very heavily. And uh, for stationary patterns like that, there might be a room to incorporate the classical processing uh, to... As a preprocessor. Yeah. But whether or not you can detect that tone is another story. <laughs> yeah. Chaining to nonlinear suppression was not a very good idea. Uh, so yeah. you get that suppression also when that, that tone is not even not there. Right? Yes. So in that, any, in any case. There's not enough variety in the noise data. Yeah. So in... Just as one Vacuum cleaner, which has a discord, so we need to vacuum cleaners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, data augmentation will, will definitely help there. And another major finding is that by having the uh, SNR weighted or the speech distortion weighted uh, objectives, we are able to enhance the noise, uh, yeah, sorry, enhance the speech with, not with a broadband mask. So the problem with before was it was, it's almost acting like a VAD where it suppressed everything when there's no speech present. And when there is speech, you just let open the entire, uh, the, the frequency and let everything go. But with the new weighting function we have, it's uh, much more selective um, in terms of frequency of what uh, the enhancer is able to suppress. And also by listening, we confirm that. All right, so in conclusions, we propose a DNN-based online speech enhancement system uh, with a very compact neural network. Uh, the storage complexity is uh, a linear function of your feature dimension squared. So by reducing that number, you can have even smaller networks. Uh, we introduced two novel learning objectives uh, motivated by balancing speech distortion and noise suppression. And uh, we, thanks to Ross, we found a couple of days ago that one of the weighting function, the first one, uh, there is a paper published like seven days ago that has that in the paper. Uh, the other one uh, is still new, so let's hope by the time we... we <laughs> We read a paper early. Quickly, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we study the impact of multiple factors associated with, with uh, training a neural network for speech quality, and we explore feature normalization. But as Ivan said, we need uh, more variation in the data to confirm that. Uh, we study the effect of sequence length and the object, the two objective weightings. And we compare uh, competitive signal processing based and deep learning based online systems in terms of objective speech quality measures and ours perform better than the systems mentioned in this talk. And the future directions of this work involve studying the speech quality improvement by SNR. Those numbers reported before was, uh, uh, was the mean of everything, but by 
analysis on different SNRs, we might find different patterns because our objective is a function of SNR. And we will explore more learning objectives to replace uh, the mean squared error. And there are some measures we tried before that we thought works well in classical processing sense, but it turns out didn't work so well in the neural network sense, probably with the issue with training, but that's another path to explore. And uh, we can also explore to reduce the dimensionality of the, the feature to reduce the model size and improve the computation speed. <sighs> okay, that's the, the end of my talk. I want to thank all of you for coming here, but I want to thank in particular my mentor, Sebastian. It's a real pleasure working with you. And I want to thank Hannes for providing multiple tips on using Philly. 90% uh, of the experiments shown today wouldn't be uh, possible without Philly. So thank you for that. And thank you for all the other mentors in the audio and acoustics group, uh, Ivan, David, and Dimitra. And I would like to thank uh, Ross, Chandan, and Harry, who's not here, from Skype. Sorry? Harry's online. Oh, hi, Harry. Uh, I, I would like to thank them for uh, preparing uh, the training and test data on my first day here, and they gave the data to me and makes that much easier for me to uh, work. And uh, thank you for organizing the, the event. That was great. And thanks for the suggestions we have uh, through our, our uh, weekly meetings. And finally, thanks for all the interns. And I'll be missing your company when I leave. And stay in touch. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, one question, Raymond. Um, before you started out, uh, looks like you've decided to adopt uh, the same architecture as uh, conventional noise suppression in terms of using the magnitude and uh, not using the phase. Do you look at time domain approaches where you operate directly at the waveform? Uh, uh, we. Uh, uh, that's. Uh, I think we, we decided to take this approach, this uh, masking approach, uh, in the first week because uh, well, we're aware of the, the time domain enhancement, but we think that's a completely different research problem. And yeah, uh, but that's certainly a uh, direction to look for. But we probably need a, a different setup than what we have today okay. to do it, yeah. One more question. Otherwise, no. And let's thank Raymond again. Thank you.